Okay. Great. Thanks. Good. <laughs> Good to be here. Yeah. Um, I think maybe if we could just start a bit about talking about revisiting motherhood, perhaps. Right. I'm sure that's a standard go-to after Motherland in 1994, right. so almost, well, exactly 20 years on. Yes, mm -hmm. I just realized that um, coming on the train from Montreal that it was 20 years ago that I presented Motherland when Hot Dogs was just a baby and my children were very young and it was one of the first feature films, documentaries that I had done. It was a very different time, I think there were five Canadian feature films at that time, I and mean, everything's exploded. But I did realize that I'm always coming back to these themes, these intersections between the personal and the political and family and economics, and I, I think I can't get away from it. I just, every time, I just want to go there. I think there's something in the mix that I constantly want to unpeel and discover. I was wondering if it was even intentional, if you thought, oh, this is 20 years later, I should specifically revisit this topic and see if anything has changed or... Not really, and what's also very strange is that in 2004, I made a film called um, No More Tears Sister that was set in Sri Lanka, also a family and political drama um, documentary. So it seems like every few years I have to get this this um, great investigation going, and, and I do love it. It's, it's where I feel I belong. And with Motherland was, to me at least, felt more almost um, sociological in that there was a uh, wider range of voices and there was a clear attempt at speaking to different people from different communities. Um, whereas with Come Worry With Us, exclamation point, um, is focused on one, on one woman and, uh, well, We'll talk more about the collective, right. but I was wondering about that choice to just focus on um, on Jessica. Well, I think there's many levels. At ni 1994, I was a less experienced filmmaker. It was one of the last films that Studio D did, which was a women's studio of mm -hmm. the film board. So there was a kind of consciousness about I inclusion then. And I think um, I was kind of uh, creating vocabulary for um, okay, well, what is this thing called mothering? I mean, since then, and I'm not a attributing my own film to creating an explosion of dialogues about mothering, but I think the, the, the vocabulary was tentative, and I was, I was just sort of going out into the darkness, gr you know, grasping at, at, um, at voices. And I think there was an ethos at the fi film board Mm -hmm. at that time of having a uh, black woman, having a Chinese woman, having women with, um, you know, whose children were disabled. Whereas I think today in terms of my filmmaking practice, I'm, I'm much more free. And honestly, when I heard about Jessica going on tour with a baby, I, I didn't know her. I just knew of a nanny that was going with her. But I had some kind of very huge, sensation. I mean, it was like falling in love, which is weird, <laughs> but that's, that's, I suppose, what intuition is. And I think I'm mature enough in my filmmaking practice that I can follow it. Sometimes it doesn't work, um, but at least I feel secure enough to follow it and, and pay attention. Well, I want to talk about working with Jessica, but I'm glad you brought up Studio D. Um, can you just talk a bit about working there and, I mean, the legacy of Kathleen Shannon as well right. and her, especially her Working Mothers series as right. well. Right. Yeah. Well, when I came to Montreal, because I'm originally from Toronto and I moved to um, Montreal, towards the end of Studio D, I was a rather younger than a lot of the uh, pioneers of mm -hmm. Studio D. So my film, in fact, was the last film. And things were, were coming down uh, in some ways. There were, people were questioning, why have a woman's studio? We don't need it anymore. Feminism is sort of done and we've looked at everything. So why is it important? Um, but there was a sense of um, that pioneering spirit still being there. And whatever people think of the Studio D films now, um, 
it's always you know, easy in retrospect to, to maybe find some of them problematic, but they really did go into places where people hadn't gone before, talking about incest and pornography and um, creating, a commu creating communities of viewers. And, and I, I think the distribution system connected to Studio D for a certain amount of time was very exciting. I mean, what, what's not to like about having a film and having money going out to schools and discussions and screenings? I mean, that's what, that's what we want today. That's what I still want. Because festivals is one thing, but also going out into, you know, into the streets in a way. That's, that's very exciting too, and they were great at doing, doing right. that. Well, and you've uh, mentioned with this film too, the uh, using it as a starting point for conversations and bringing it into art schools or and universities, and and using it as, uh, I guess, a, a tool to start discussions almost. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't like using films as tools, tools yes. because I think it's a. Um, there's no recipe with this film. It doesn't have. Uh, you should do this. I think it's a film about struggle, and I think it's a film about defining space and defining uh, working with images. Um, but I do love taking the film out and, and having people react to it and respond. And I think it's a perfect film for going with your honey or going with your friend and then having a, an enormous discussion or argument about, okay, um, if we had children, who would do what, or if I'm going to go after my passion in art and not make any money, like how will we live together? So I think those questions come out and you know, there's all kinds of nuanced response to that. There's, as I say, the film stays away from any set, uh, set response, but I think, I think in the alternative arts, for example, in cinema, in more avant-garde cinema, I don't think we talk a lot about gender and, and family. It's almost like we don't, somehow it, the sense is we don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we do. And I think we have to re-examine words like uh, sacrifice and commitment because as soon as you throw a kid into that mix, it, it somehow the argument is different. And I think for me also, what's really, really important about these films that I've tried that I'm making is um, creating a cinematographic um, language. I can't tell you how hard it is to film women and children and make it interesting. For some reason, we, we have that cultural baggage, many of us, where we look at, um, you know, scenes of being with kids or scenes of the work of parenting and just think, oh, is that ever boring? Click. So how do, you, how do you make it interesting? How do you make it not boring? How do you frame things? How do you create the sense of ambivalence or f from you know, the point of view of a mother? How do you represent uh, that, that experience? So for me, it's also a lot about the use of cinema to create a, a kind of language or the going towards those invisible spaces that we're not comfortable in. Well, I'm glad you chose the word, the work of parenting too, because I think, and especially the work of motherhood. Yes. Because um, it is either sentimentalized, you know, sort of Mother's Day card or horrific and some, yeah. I mean, that's what makes the news, right? Of yeah. some, you know, mattress, or, you know, mothers killing their yes. infants and yes. struggling with, uh, you know, postpartum depression and very real issues, but there isn't that sense of the daily grind and then how to actually make this. Right watchable in some kind of way yes. instead of yeah reducing it to the invisible yeah. um, and I think here the choice to include um, uh, Jessica's um, images from her own from her iPhone and her uh, that she had shot as well as some of her photos as well um, might have been something that played into that was that yes uh, we're very very grateful for Jessica's footage and we also gave the nanny on the bus a video camera so some of the footage is hers but Jessica is an artist and having her, her footage I think is amazing and also she allowed herself to film herself mm -hmm. during some moments of uh, frustration, ambivalence and I think that's very, very courageous because there's always that voice of saying be a good mother, love every second of it. Um, I, think, I think she was courageous enough to do that. 
But it's, it's all those things. It's, it's love too, um, because the love of a child can be really, really big. So how do you represent that and the ambivalence and the exhaustion? So that's sort of, I think, what we were all trying to get, right. get to. And was there discussions with what you did film and what you didn't film? Because I feel like there's always uh, questions of ethics come up more, especially right. when there's a very young child involved. And this is something that they're going to watch, presumably, you know, right. 10, 15, 20, 30 years hmm. from now. Or it's an like interesting that. question. I don't think, um, in terms of ethics, I do try and ask ethical questions w when I film, while mm -hmm. I film. But in terms of ethics, I don't think I had a huge dilemma because um, I tried to be very respectful in what we filmed. And I mean, Jessica and Ephraim are very media savvy. They're yeah. not like people who've never seen a camera in the developing world where you can film. I've done those films too, and you, can, you have a lot more freedom. You can film everything, and people aren't sophisticated in the ways that uh, people are here and say, no, this is, you know, this is our time, this is our space, please get out of here. So um, I think more the question actually is how much cute footage can you put into <laughs> one film um, before, you know, people get sick of it. And it's a really fine balance. I think it comes again back to this lack of, um, is it esteem or respect or comfort? comfort with seeing a lot of d domestic images, mm -hmm. people have a, th a low threshold. And once you go over that threshold, it's, it's like, get me out of here. So I think those were more of the questions. Um, in terms of the ethics, I, I always knew that Jessica and Ephraim would see cuts, and that was, right. that was really, really clear for me. And that's fine, I'm, because coming into this film, I really didn't know their world. I came to this film as a political filmmaker and as one who, you know, has done art and loved art, but I didn't know their art um, as much as I do know. So I knew I had a lot to learn about the music industry and about how they lived. And I think that I was really hoping to, to find artists who could imagine doing things differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that what avant-garde is? avant-garde artists do. They create new ways and new spaces for the rest of us to kind of follow and think, um, yeah, maybe I could do that too. So, for example, I don't know if you remember in the film, but the band makes very conscious decisions, economic decisions about the tour nanny mm -hmm. and the, the bus, because usually they don't take a bus. And they, you know, for sure, they never had to hire an extra person. They always are, are very work proud and do everything themselves. So who's going to pay for the nanny and who's going to pay for the tour bus that they didn't need to pay for before? And when I found out, and it was very sort of nonchalant the way they said it, that the whole band shared those costs, for me it was a revolutionary moment because you don't usually hear that. I mean, can you imagine in your work, if you had a child, that your whole workspace would pitch in and hire the babysitter? No, and this is what I, and I remember that moment very clearly too, because to me it felt like the closest, you know, we'd get to socialized uh, national daycare program or something right. like that. And even, I think the, the title resonates with that as well, this us, this collective. It's not come worry with Jessica. Right. This is, you know, it takes a, to use that old expression, it takes a village to, to mm. raise a child. And in this case, you know, it's about everybody's world shifting and not just placing it solely on her. Mm. Um, but I, I did want to uh, talk about, I guess, the, the balance that you wanted to strike in terms of allowing Ephraim's voice into the film as well um, and, and whether or not you made a decision of, even if it was a mathematical 60-40 thing or something like that. If, mm. Not really. I think um, I'm really happy that Ephraim felt that he wanted to participate and include his voice because I think I came into their lives at a, a kind of crossroads where they had a lot of questions and because they work and live and have a child together, I think they were struggling together, maybe in different ways and going through, they, they come from such different, um, dif different histories 
But I know in my own case that so much of my own ability to create films when I had small children depended on having a very participatory, supportive partner. So I think often, you know, we, we can look at women in isolation and see what, what they're going through. But I think that's interesting to me, what kind of little cluster of society is around the women. The woman. I don't think that, a w I think it's very, very hard if you have economic needs to do it on your own. And I think that's one of the conclusions that, that Jessica makes while she's asking other women is, um, you, you can't do it alone, like you need that, you need so much support, that's what she says, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's true. I, d I don't know if she knew that right at the beginning, I think that's something that became really, really clear. Yeah, well, I, the, I love this process of capturing her actively fighting against the isolation as well, that she says at one point, she's, I'm a stay-at-home mother, and she couldn't believe it, but at no point does she feel um, left aside, and I think that's a lot of her as well, of reaching out and talking to, especially her sister's involvement yes. as well. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think she needed that, you know, that connection, and one thing that happens to a lot of uh, women, I don't want to scare you, <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that can happen when one has children, and maybe it's true for men as well, if they, if they are the primary caregiver, I imagine so, is that you're very, very active and going everywhere and doing everything and then suddenly this creature has huge needs and a lot of those needs mean that you have to take a step back and so suddenly your whole social circle is no longer present in the way that it has been. And I think, I do, I do, I do really think, this way to <laughs> I do really think that Jessica, she experienced some isolation, of course. I mean, yeah. if you're a rock musician and all your friends and everyone you know and work with is suddenly on tour and you're at home, of course it's going to be astounding mm -hmm. um, and very unsettling. And again, I think what Jessica experiences in the film is, is kind of the extreme of what many other people experience. And now with the, the sort of blurring of work and life, mm -hmm. I think the model um, that we all aspire to is almost like a 20-year-old guy being completely free and available and energetic all the time and not having any, any personal uh, needs or you know, requirements. And so I think it's very, very challenging to keep, keep not just a foot in the door, but just keep that part of your life still, still going. Right, and this question of what happens to female artists of a certain age, of that, that's touched on in the film as well, that you know, in 30s or mid-30s, then suddenly they disappear, and where do they yeah. go? And it's this question of, well, they had kids, and what happens after that? I think it's partly that they have kids. I think there's different... Um, there's different groups and, and thinkers that are trying to figure out what happens. In Montreal, for example, there's a group, Realize Atrice Equitable, mm -hmm. which is equal, Equality Directors, yeah. has done a lot of um, quantitative work on what happens to women, for example, in the film industry, right. because they disappear. And there's, uh, when you look at the statistics, it's actually much worse than you would think. Mm -hmm and certainly much worse than you would think that we should be in 2014. Maybe in 2070 those statistics made some sense, but not today. Um, and I think there's a lot of factors. One is, um, one is, of course, becoming a parent and just, as Jessica says, that she and Ephraim, even though they're these radical artists, musicians, they fell into these very, very traditional roles. Mm -hmm. It's easy to happen unless you work at it or you uh, discuss it with your partner and figure out a different way of doing it. So I think there's that. But I think also women, um, unfortunately, one hypothesis is that as women get older and they've been refused, maybe a producer doesn't think their, their film ideas punchy enough or has heroic, uh, enough heroic uh, moments, 
Um, they might be rejected several times, not being supported, and women ten then um, fall away. Because I think in film schools and art schools and music schools, there's more, actually more women now than, than men. Mm -hmm. But you know, we'll see with your generation, what, what do you think? Well, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking my graduate program, there was three men in a group of 15. We were all women, but then I looked at the faculty and it was, there was, I think, two women mm -hmm. and the rest were men. So there is, at some point, it tips in some other, in some other, uh, in, you know, in a fate not in our favor, I right. suppose. Um, but the, I was, uh, this question of, you know, being rejected and films not having enough heroics um, reminded me of something Nadia says, which says, women's narratives just aren't considered interesting. Yeah. Which resonated yeah. so deeply with me. Yeah. yeah. I, I love Nadia's voice in the film. Mm -hmm. I think everything she says is just spot on because she really does, in a way, open the chapter and by saying, um, women's narratives, just face it, they're not considered interesting. And then when Jessica says, didn't you always think that films about, you know, art about motherhood was just yuck? Mm -hmm. Which I think is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a reaction that I think people coming into this film might have, but luckily from what we're hearing, we've been able to, within the film to kind of switch it. So I'm really, really pleased to hear that because that's exactly what, what I wanted. And it refuses that kind of didactic tone that so much uh, literature and materials about motherhood takes too, of what, you know, this is how you should do it or this is yeah. how you shouldn't do it. It's, yeah, as you suggested, a, a potential new model for yeah. it. But yeah. I think too, the, um, what, when Nadia said that as well is uh, just having a, a space and a venue to actually begin to talk about these questions. Um, and how she then is, she also is an interesting figure, I think, because she doesn't want children as well and says that very vocally. Um, but there's a sense too, and I think in feminism as well, talking about motherhood is passe maybe, or I don't know if you feel that way at all. But I, I, I don't think it's passe at all. That's not, well, I, it's, I, don't think it, I don't think it's passe, but I guess that it's been, um, it can be contentious because it's considered traditional. And so, you know, is this something that we just fully reject and don't talk about at all? I but mean, it's human life. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, no. <laughs> is, is there another way? I don't think we're, we're having test tube children, you know, apart from human beings yet. I think it's just uncomfortable. I mm -hmm. think it's just, I think it's just really uncomfortable because there is so much tradition pulling at us and, and we're amb ambivalent about going there and I imagine your generation even more than mine because you've been told probably by you know very supportive parents or women around you you can do anything and just go for it and you know be the best that you can it's what I tell my two adult da daughters as well but the reality is that things do happen when you have a child um, and it's good to, if you are with a partner, to discuss those things. Mm -hmm. There's just no getting away from it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no getting away from it. And I, I think this film is a really interesting way to, to come at it because it's, it's, it's also, we're, li we're living through a very um, precarious economic reality. And I don't know how many people are raising the question about how women, uh, let alone women artists, are going to fare through that. Mm -hmm. when, when you told me that your film class only had three guys, I thought, oh, all these poor women, you know, all these <laughs> <laughs> impoverished women are, gonna, are going to um, graduate from film school and there's no paid work out there. Yeah, no, I, yeah, you should tell me about it. <laughs> But I, I, what struck me too is the way that, that Jessica pushed back from being fully a mother. Or, and I think that's, and I, don't, I wasn't articulating that clearly when I was saying there's a, maybe a difficulty in talking about motherhood because it's supposed to be an all-consuming, all thing that you have a kid and now you're a mother and that's it. And there's no room to be an artist slash mother or a musician slash, slash mother. Um, but for her, it was, you know, negotiating it into a new into the world that she already had 
Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. I think, I think Jessica in the film is very much an inventor. And mm. there are some um, other women like Natalia Janchek of mm. The Deers and um, Amy Milan of, of The Stars. I mean, they're different groups. They're more, m much more commercial than Silver Mount Zion is. Mm -hmm. So they have different considerations. And, but I think, um, I think Jessica's just building, Jessica and Ephraim and their band are just, you know, putting, laying the foundation to see if this is going to work. I don't think they know that it'll work the next time. I think it's sort of one, one phase at a time, mm -hmm. but they're, I think they're asking really great questions and, and probably they just love doing what they do so much that they're going to just keep on trying and share that with their son. And for them, I think Jessica in the film asks, you know, is being a good mother sharing what I love the most? Mm -hmm. And maybe for now that answer is, yes, go for it. You know, that's, it's, it's a great moment to do that. And I think in terms of their son, he certainly doesn't seem to be suffering. No. <laughs> Seems to be, you know, uh, uh, the editor that we worked with, uh, Tony Asimopoulos, he was envious of that child growing up in um, this very, very, active and passionate community so you can say he's a lucky kid mm -hmm. and for me too what i was uh really struck by was actually just seeing w women in the arts with children because i just I, I don't see that that often and there's just doesn't seem then thinking of my own future and i think well if there's no model for it then then how does it work um yeah, yeah. It's, we just have to keep on inventing and looking for those spaces where the two can coexist. Uh, Natalia Janchek of The Deers um, says something in the film w which said, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember her exact words, but it's something like, before you have a kid, the band is your 100% commitment. Mm -hmm. That is it. But when you have a kid, it can no longer be a 100% commitment commitment. So I, th I think what the film is asking, can one still be an artist if you don't have that same kind of commitment, but maybe it's as intense, but you've just made it wider. Right. And, and in terms of men, are, can they be fathers and still have that 100% commitment to being an artist? Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah, and recalibrating, um, we touched on this early at the beginning of the interview, but recalibrating how we think of sacrifice or even defining great artists. Yes. And what you give and what you don't give. And yeah, and the totality of identity, I guess, which mm -hmm. is, again, what I think Jessica's really, she doesn't, she doesn't want that and doesn't want that first as a musician and choosing to have a child mm. and then doesn't want to be consumed by mother mm. <laughs> too. Um, but uh, one to, another part that uh, resonated with me was with, um, I think Ephraim says something along the lines of this normalizing force that the child has. Um, and can you talk a bit about filming that, uh, capturing that dynamic, I guess, mm. and within the context of the band specifically right. being this, very political, socialistly minded group. Right. Well, I think um, many people who know Ephraim's work know that he's a very, very political, very principled man with um, strong ideas about society, the, the economy, and so on. And uh, he comes from a very difficult place in his youth, which he's written about. He was mm -hmm. homeless. He uh, grew up, he was very, very much alone for a long time and um, I don't think he ever imagined for quite a few years there that he would ever have a house or he would have a child. Yeah, I think it, he's like before before the kid, it was like his checking account was the most normal thing he had. I think yeah. he says, which is, yeah. So, and I think, um, you know, he obviously loves his child very much, but he, he didn't have that kind of model of you know, being a great suburban dad, or I don't even know yeah. if that's a great, I don't even know if that's a great model, but he didn't have a model, especially for not only where he's coming from, but what he does, being on the road so much. And so what I really love about the film, and I love Ephraim's participation with the film in, in letting us share him getting closer, because that's really painful when 
if you love someone very intensely, but you, you just don't know how to show it. And I think of, at the beginning of the film, we do, show, we do have those shots, and they actually come from a lot from Jessica's camera of, of Ephraim seeming quite awkward and yes. seeming quite distant. And that just changes over the course of the film, and you just feel that, I don't know, that he's not like a changed man in terms of the, you know, he sees Jesus Christ or anything like that. It's not that, but that he, he's discovered more sides of himself that are really, that are very important and really, and he loves them, those sides too. Mm -hmm. And that's the moments too where I feel like the film would be, uh, expose itself to judge, or would be people, that's the moment where people would judge. And that's where the, the film sort of opens itself up in a really painful way where I can't imagine, that's where I suppose I wondered about the kid watching it and you know, years yeah. on from now as we're watching it and saying like, oh, my dad didn't just you know, want to pick up a baseball bat right away or yeah. something like that. But I guess that's their story. Yeah. It, it is really strange, but um, many people after they see the film, they say that they cried through it, which mm -hmm. I never intended because it's, it's, or I never thought that it would um, evoke that in people. And I'm trying to understand why, and probably as I screen it more, and if I hear those reactions more, mm -hmm. I'll, um, I'll figure it out. But I think it is something about, um, you know, people wanting intimacy and wanting to, to be committed to this thing that they're committed to, and, and how, do you, how do you put that together and, and make a, a good life? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that so many of us share. Maybe it's that, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I definitely, I cried a bit. But <laughs> and now I'm trying to examine why. And I think it's, I think it's watching the, because um, it feels like she's, Jessica's facing the impossible. And at least maybe that's something that I feel it, um, the idea of, of motherhood seems so impossible to negotiate in the arts. So watching her struggle through it and surmount it as well is, was what really, I mm -hmm. think, what, you know, mm -hmm. brought a tear to my eye. <laughs> and and would, would seeing what the band did, for example, would it give you courage to maybe make demands on, not demands, but make requests or, or kind of it, talk about it with well, your colleagues? Yeah, well, I think this is, that's why that us in the title resonates with me so much because I we want it to be a shifting of everybody's perspective about what it means to be a mother and it's everyone needs to step into that role a bit and everyone needs to shift their perspectives about how we view it and it doesn't just fall on one person um, and I you know I think that's the message behind there's a quotation at the beginning you know things are things are bad but they have to get better mm -hmm. and it seems that if they are gonna get better it would fall into that sort of revolutionary potential of shifting our whole view of it not being a a singular, a singular subject position, but like, a, but a collective and a group. Mm. Um, That's the ideal. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's got to be doable. Yeah, I mean, because you're, because all the women, for example, in your film class, they're, they want to make films, they want to express themselves and do great work. They're, they're not going to go back into some fifties model. They, they, yeah. they'll, they'll go crazy. Well, and this is, um, and it's interesting that this question of post-feminism was even coming up in, the, in 1994 when you were making Motherland of, oh, do we even need Studio D? Do we need a female thing? Like, feminism's done it all. Um, and I feel like that's what I hear constantly now in 2014 is, everything's good, we did it all, it's fine, we don't, we don't need this movement anymore. It doesn't even, and the way that people reacted so badly to the word feminism, mm. too, that has become... The new F word, right. basically. Yeah. Can you reinvent the word? Well, yeah, well, that's the discussion now, I guess, too. And for me, seeing this film, I was, oh, this is clearly a feminist film, but I don't think feminism, the, the word, right. doesn't come up at any, at any point in yeah. it. Um, I think what, one thing that um, clearly kind of disturbed me in make, when I made the film is I got the impression that people, women who didn't feel like they could you know, have a revolutionary band <laughs> around them, yeah. um, really took it as a personal failure that they couldn't do all these things in the way that they wanted to. And there was kind of not a shared language for understanding, um, which I think my generation had. I remember at, 
film festivals, if there were 20% of all the films that were just made by women, somebody inevitably would get up and start yelling and, you know, it irritated some people, yes, <laughs> but there was a kind of language out there. Whereas now, I think women are told that you can do it if you want to and just, you know, they're not seeing any kind of structural yeah. impediments. So I think it's fantastic that you have a journal and that you're okay. writing <laughs> and, and, you know, we're having these conversations and the women in the film are having these conversations because there's some things that are happening to so many women. It's not just an individual thing. Yeah. And it's not just coincidence that there's, you know, 20% of the films being made are, or, you know, 20% is high. It's like 8% of the mm -hmm. films that are made directors and writers are women. So it's just, I guess we have to reinvent the language for looking at it. And that's why I think um, it's also um, a question of how we use aesthetics. We have to be uh, inventive and courageous and we have to think of new ways of, of talking about these things. Well, n when you said to this, bringing back the structural, it's not just the individual, which again, I think this is where the, the film's radical potential falls into because it shows this need for structural change. Um, and we talked about this before the camera started rolling, but um, talking about you had uh, contacted Nina Power, who was very adamant about uh, addressing this, yeah, one-dimensional feminism of just my choice is my choice and that's fine. Right. Yeah. Yes, I was really, um, because I admire Nina Power a lot, I, I just sent her the, the film and she was very gracious and generous and she viewed it and I think she really loved it. She was very moved by it. And um, I think it's just trying to unpeel all these assumptions that everything's been settled. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it, it just hasn't. Yeah, no, I think that's... And what, to this traditional question that comes up of, in this radical avant-garde space of these default positions, which might explain why, why we tend to fall back into them. Um, and then if we don't question them, then what, then what happens? I, I think Jessica is, this didn't come into the film, but I, I think, I, I've definitely heard her say that she really believes that women, before they have children, you know, should discuss these things or hopefully will have a, some kind of discussion, a real discussion with their partners. And you can't know what it is before it happens, but you kind of maybe can start talking and just what are the expectations? Because that default is very, um, it's very easy to fall into. And then you, I believe that women will climb out of it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's like, um, it just takes that much more effort to climb out and then yeah. succeed. And then, yeah, and just a, I slightly touched on this, but then this idea of if it's boring, then no one wants to hear about it. And it's like a self-silencing thing from the outset that if you do bring it up, then you're either baby crazy and you're know, falling to some kind of traditional female role, whatever that is, um, as opposed to thinking of reproduction as you know, potentially revolutionary and raising a new generation of conscious, actively minded right. children, right. not just, yeah, right. not just right. the suburbs or something I, like I that. I actually find it painful when you say that those are the reactions. Well, this, this is what I've, I've felt at least that it's, you know, no one wants to hear about that. And then you're just, you know, being a baby crazy rom-com, okay. you know, stereotype. When, like, no, I want to have an honest, conversation about how this is a viable, mm -hmm. a viable and potentially interesting revolutionary thing that, that child rearing can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, um, I think for men too, like there's been so much emphasis on women leaving the private sphere and going into the public sphere and, and doing everything, you know, from being a firefighter to an army mm -hmm. sergeant to everything, but there hasn't, the, the, the home space it's not really that valued. So, yeah. so you can't expect men are sort of dying to like stay home and do diapers. I mean, probably maybe not that many people want to do that. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to share both, you know, both parts? So I think it's a, I really hope men see this film 
and engage with their partners or their sisters or their mothers and, and mm -hmm. talk about it because with men being in the public sphere or you know, the work sphere and, and the, I think they feel so many consequences if they, if, if they uh, don't succeed every second either. Mm -hmm. There's so much pressure on them to, to succeed and uh, especially in this um, context of precarity precariousness. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot there. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, well it seems it's we're thinking about it as a as a you know a festival film and I'm thinking, oh but you want it to play to this a bigger audience, which then makes me, you know, concerned a I'm always worrying about everything, but you know, if we're going to worry about motherhood, that's one thing. And then there's this question of even just film distribution and how you get it out there. Um, I don't well, know if that's <laughs> luckily we're um, very blessed to have a great um, distributor in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, Film de Trois Mars, and they do. They they only take on about eight films a year, eight or ten films a year. They do a great job. And um, in the States, we have Cinema Guild, which was, I'm very pleased about. I feel mm -hmm. very honored to be in that collection. So I think we'll have a good run at it. And I'm, I'm very dedicated to having the film go out. As a matter of fact, uh, I asked a friend of uh, my daughter's who's in art school, and I, I just like very innocently said, how do you think you're going to make money when you come out? And she said, well, her professor said there are grants. And I thought, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is that, is that what we're learning about? Mm -hmm. Yet you go to art school and then you come out and then you survive on grants. I mean, that's, that's dangerous thinking and it's, again, it's not preparing women very much for the real world. So um, I'd like to be sort of a bit of a thorn and go to those places and, and maybe suggest that there are not going to be a ton of grants or not everybody's going to get them. and. There, it's going to be so m competitive, so how, how are we going to make the world that we want? Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll leave it on that. Now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Got to talk about motherhood, which is one of my favorite topics. I don't ever want to talk to yeah. you about.